Good morning and welcome to Northside's uh, first attempt at online services. Uh, we are gathered here with a small group today that will participate. So we will have singing, just like normal. You'll be able to watch the screen uh, behind me and watch the words. So please feel free to sing along while you're there. I will have a time of prayer as well. So please pray with us. And then we'll move through uh, the serving of the Lord's Supper. So hopefully everyone, uh, you have your um, supplies at home that you can also participate with us in that as well. Then we'll move into the sermon time with Chris Wee, and then we'll close as we always do with a prayer. So welcome and enjoy. Do anything 
anything to bring disrespect or to cast dispersion upon him. We pray for those who are, have not yet put your son on in baptism that they will learn from, the, from your word what they need to do in order to make the sacrifice of your son advantageous for them. Go with us now, Father, as we continue. Give us open hearts. Give us open spirits, open minds. Give us a understanding of your word greater than we've ever had before. And Father, finally, we would ask that you would forgive us as we have shown a willingness to forgive others and as we have exhibited penitent spirits. We thank you, Father, again for every blessing and ask that your comfort and guidance will always be with us. And these things we do ask in your son's most holy name. And amen.
we come before you, Lord, with this, this bread that represents your broken body, the sacrifice that you made, we pray that we would be mindful of that sacrifice, Lord, and of the love, both of you and your son, that this sacrifice be made, that you would send your only begotten son, that he would be willing to live life as a man, to be tortured, to be beaten, to die, in order that we would have this conduit of prayer, this avenue to have life eternal with you. Pray for you protected, no matter who is well pleasing to you. This we pray in your son's name.
kind of put in mind with the book, with the book of Proverbs. Um, one of the things that has come out progressively throughout this study is that when we get into the New Testament, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24 and verse 30, we're called to see Jesus as the fullest personification of the wisdom that originated with God before creation even began. It's that kind of wisdom. And so Jesus is the full personification. So what we've been trying to see is Jesus in the book of Proverbs each step of the way. We're going to continue to do that this morning. The blessing that you'll see in our outline this morning that I really want to highlight today, if you take nothing else away, take this away. Jesus will produce wisdom in your life progressively. Slowly but surely, he's going to grow you in wisdom as you continue to learn and read. And there's certainly a call in chapter 10, just like there was in chapter 9, an invitation to read on, to keep learning, to keep trying, and to keep studying. So one of the questions we need to deal with today is, is there a right way to, and a wrong way to read the book of Proverbs? And I hope we've kind of discovered it. Yeah, it kind of seems that way. Um, are they easy to understand? It may seem like that at first, but, but there's something else beneath the, the surface here. And, and here's my adjournment. Here's my uh, suggestion to you this morning. Don't read Proverbs like a Pharisee. Okay? Don't read Proverbs like a Pharisee. The Pharisees are, are looking for uh, the nitty-gritty details, and they're kind of missing the overall picture. Um, they tend to think that they can slowly but surely, step by step, build their way into salvation, into good standing with God, to make God love them. And that is our temptation in the book of Proverbs, to think that we can just build our wisdom up enough to where we're good enough, and where God sees us in just the right line, or where God loves us just enough to where we're okay with God. And that is not something that, that Solomon is trying to get us to be concerned about as we, as we read through the book of Proverbs. Now, uh, what I am suggesting is instead, you read it like a blood-bought child of God. That you, you have received your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and that Proverbs is here to help you um, show your gratitude back towards Him, to appreciate your salvation, and to show Him in everyday life that you are still tied to Him, that you are faithful to Him. So, so this is, from chapter 10 on, this is Proverbs proper, you might say. This is the second part of the book, and it's different. Um, these are the short, pithy sayings, the, the random wisdom not the extended discourse that we've seen in the first few chapters. Proverbs, we said this before, Proverbs reveals where our lives are in conflict with God. Uh, it shows us where our lives are essentially idolatrous when we're following the wayward woman, when we are worshiping at her temple instead of the temple of Lady Wisdom. And, and so it shows us where we're idolatrous, it shows us where we are faithless, um, and the main idol that Proverbs really is getting at is usually the idol of self. And it's, it's at the root of most of our problems and much of the foolishness uh, in Proverbs that we read about. We can have uh, no spiritual versus secular divide in our lives. That's something we talked about before. Um, throughout the book of Proverbs, we see uh, the need to, to consider our whole lives uh, in the context that they are in and try to uh, understand God in that context as well. It's interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, one of the things that Paul says to those Corinthians is, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So there's no separation that we can compartmentalize our lives the way that we think we can. This is worship, this is not, this is secular, this is spiritual. Proverbs doesn't jive that way. So one of the questions that we're studying here in chapter 10 is, well, how does life work best? And the message is, it works best in harmony with God first, the vertical relationship, and then in harmony with others second, the, the, the horizontal relationship. Practical wisdom is what's there for us to show me where I'm in harmony or where I'm dissonant, where I'm not in the chord, I'm not harmonized. And so Proverbs 10 through 31, it may seem to us to be random, um, but it's not. Because here's what Solomon is doing. And we've said this before. Solomon is following Deuteronomy chapter 6. He's following sort of the foundation of the, the 
Israelite way of learning the law. Um, and in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7, that's where he's saying us, uh, to, especially your parents, you know, to teach the ways to your children when and how. As, as, you're, as you're lying down, as you're getting up, as you're going throughout your day, and all the normal ways you teach your children. Well, how do you teach your children? Do you, uh, do you map out every single moment that you spend with them? Monday we're going to see this and talk about this, and Tuesday we're going to do this and talk about this, and, and Wednesday and so forth and so on. Or do you respond in crisis to every situation that arises as they come? That's how we deal with our kids, isn't it? Uh, they, they come up with a question, they have a thought, there's something that they do, and that's when we teach it. So that seems to be more the method that, that Solomon is using in chapter 10 and so forth, um, because he's addressing each and every need as it rises and comes our way. So it seems random, but it's not. And you'll continue to see if we study these themes that will follow throughout these other chapters that hip hop, skip, and jump, but they build for us a cohesive picture of what God is looking for. So I'm going to read a little bit here. This is chapter 10, verse 1. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. By the way, I think you could switch father and mother and it would still be valid. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, verse 2 says, but righteousness delivers from death. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. He who gathers in summer is a prudent son, but he who sleeps in harvest is a son who brings shame. Um, so one of the areas that Proverbs is going to address, not only in chapter 10, but throughout, is wisdom regarding work and money. Uh, it gets more personal here. In general, a wise person will, will make more money because they're wiser. They kind of reason through things. They're, they're more ready for those kinds of things. And that sounds positive, but Proverbs isn't saying that every time you gain wealth, it's a sign that God is blessing you, okay? It's not the health and wealth gospel. The key to understanding Proverbs is to view all of them in light of Christ. And I suppose that's true with all of Scripture. Um, but to, to view, view things with Christ in light and, and in the light of eternity as well. So Christ in eternity, even in the story of Jesus, you can see verse 2 played out. Um, verse 2 is, uh, treasures gained by wickedness do not profit. You remember Judas? Judas got rich very quick. It did not profit, and it led to death. But in contrast, righteousness delivers from death. And in the life of Jesus himself, even though, yes, he died physically, what did Jesus do? He was raised. God raised him up. And so there's this deliverance from death. So Jesus, if we view that in terms of Jesus, it makes so much more sense to us. So is, good, is money good or is money bad? Is wealth wise or is it foolish? That's not so much the question. Um, in Proverbs 11, verse 28, whoever trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Proverbs 13 and verse 11, wealth gained hastily will dwindle, but whoever gathers little by little will increase it. And so it's not so much money being good or bad, it's how we get it. It's the slow versus fast dichotomy here. And the same is true when it comes to how Proverbs addresses things like laziness, which are connected to those verses as well. It's, it's not about, it's not our vision of laziness like the couch potato that we would normally think of just sitting around doing nothing, eating potato chips. Um, it's about one or a person who can't finish assignments, who doesn't finish the things that they start. That's the problem going on here. So, so wisdom is about your actions and how they affect uh, those that you have around you. That's what this, what this, this wisdom is about. So laziness is actually, if you think about it, we've connected other things like this. It's a Jesus problem. Your laziness is a Jesus problem. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul said, But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith. And it's worse than an unbeliever. Paul is calling us on the carpet saying, if you're lazy, you don't take care of your family. In whatever way you can, you haven't followed the way of wisdom. That's the laziness that he's concerned about. Matthew chapter 25, verse 20, in that parable that Jesus tells about the master and the servants, 
It says in verse 20, he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing the talents, uh, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, he who had the, the two talents came forward. The same story, right? Enter in, you have the talents, you use them. Enter into the joy of your master. Um, so what's he saying there? What's Jesus telling us there? This way that we come across our wealth is important. And the way that we then use that wealth is important. Laziness uh, will not keep us uh, from, well, it will keep us. Uh, from doing what God wants us to do. So it keeps us from providing for our families the way that we need to. And if I gain wealth too quickly, lazily, I don't get to learn from the mistakes of, of gaining wealth slowly. Jesus can slowly shape me and mold me into a better, wiser wealth handler or manager. So we have wisdom in Proverbs uh, regarding uh, our wealth and our laziness. Uh, there's also wisdom in Proverbs, a lot of wisdom about words and mouths, the things that come out of our mouths. Here's a case in point from chapter 10. Um, let's, uh, let's look at verse, I think it's verse 8. The wise of heart will receive commandments, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. Uh, what's the point here? The point is, a babbling fool speaks more than listens. We have two ears, we have one mouth. There's a proportion that God is going for there, even in our own physical design. And if that's me, then essentially I'm worshiping the idol of self again. If I'm not listening to others, if I'm not taking in their thoughts and their views, I'm not allowing myself to hear my potential mistakes and to learn from them, similar to before. Being able to receive advice has everything to do with Jesus. Uh, Jesus himself uh, had to listen to uh, someone else. Uh, and of course, he always listened well, but in particular, if you think about Jesus in the days of his flesh, this is Hebrews 5, verse 7. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, what did he do? He learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And so even Jesus himself sets for us this example. How many times does he say to his disciples, my food is to do the will of my Father. I'm doing the will of my Father. It's not my own will, it's his will. Because he can listen to God's advice and instruction and follow it. So those who talk a lot, instead of listening, have more opportunity to sin a lot, to make mistakes a lot. So we need to think about who can produce in us the ability to be careful about what we say, to, to monitor that. Well, it's Jesus. Proverbs 13 and 3 says, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. And so we need Jesus to help us batten down the hatches to control our tongue, like James says, and be ready for those things. So Proverbs has wisdom in those areas. Proverbs also has wisdom, thankfully, for our relationships. How we deal with each other as human beings, how we handle neighbors and, and secrets and things like that has to do with Jesus. Um, this is from Proverbs chapter 11, uh, verses 12. Oh, I'm sorry, let's read from Proverbs 10. Uh, I'm going to read on in verse 12. Proverbs 10 and verse 12, he says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. On the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found. But a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. Um, so again, the, the words, how we handle our, our relationships day to day matters. And so in Proverbs chapter 11, and uh, this is verse 12 and 13, it says, Whoever belittles his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding remains silent. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. But he who is trustworthy in spirit keeps a thing covered. How do we handle those kinds of relationships? Our neighbors, do we treat them well? We treat them badly. That reveals how we are with Jesus. How we handle someone's secrets? Do we blast them everywhere? Do we hold them in confidence? That matters to Jesus. Proverbs chapter 11 and uh, verse 24. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. How do we handle relationships with people who don't have what we have? Those who are in need and in want. The poor, the needy. Right? Proverbs 
Proverbs addresses that. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10. Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Proverbs has something to say about how we treat our beasts, our animals, our pets, and those kinds of things. Yeah, it's, it's not like this major thing that we need to worry about all the time, but it does bring into consideration if I'm badly treating even an animal, what does that say about me? What does that say about my relationship with God? Proverbs 13 and verse 1, a wise son hears his father's instructions, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. So how do I uh, handle even my, my parents? Do I listen to them? Uh, and then also about who we spend time with, who's, who's our company, who do we date, what kinds of relationships are we in? Proverbs 13 and verse 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. And, and again, Jesus does this so well. Think about Jesus and his parents. In, in the story of Luke chapter 2, he goes to the temple. They can't find him. Uh, when he is finally found, what does he choose to do? Because he could have done probably anything he wanted to. He's you know, God's son. But in chapter, 15, in chapter 2, verse 51, and he went down, and with them, his parents, and came to Nazareth, and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And then speaking of his mother, how does Jesus treat her? Well, in John chapter 19, while he's on the cross in agony, in verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then from and behold your mother to the disciple. He said, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. He made sure that his mom was taken care of, even in those situations. So this matters to Jesus, these relationships that we have. And then you go, okay, what about conflict? Because that's, that's what relationships are all about. It's kind of about conflict. Um, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus say in a conflict? Proverbs has wisdom for that. Chapter 15 and verse 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. So what would Jesus do with that? Paul says to us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's what Jesus is all about. He's about bringing people back into relationship, healing relationship, bringing peace in relationship, not only with God, but with others. Ephesians 2 and verse 14, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. He's about bringing reconciliation to light. And then finally this morning, wisdom uh, leading to temporary and also eternal blessings. Proverbs talks about those things as well. And so, really, Proverbs 10 through 31, when you boil it down, it's all about conduct and consequences. Solomon's a great teacher. And I'll let you read through the rest of that chapter and you'll see it. But Solomon's a great teacher because he teaches us both the, the what, this is what you need to do, and the why. This is why you need to do it. These are the consequences if you don't. These are the blessings and rewards if you do. So if I'm foolish, away from Christ, that's why I'm foolish, the things that I fear, the things that I worry about will come to pass in my life, in the here and now. And if they don't come in the here and now, they're going to come in the, in the eventual, in terms of my eternal lack of salvation. If I'm wise in this life with Jesus, I'm spending time with Jesus, walking with Jesus, finding Jesus, then the good that I desire may come in this life and it will definitely come in the life after, in what's to come. The results are presented as both present and future. Look at chapter uh, 12, Proverbs 12, verse 21. No ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. And we would argue with that at first. We would say sometimes bad things happen to good people. True. But in the eventuality, True ill, true bad things don't happen to good people because of the eventuality of being with Jesus and being with God. Yes, we're going through a crisis right now. We're going through really tough times. A lot of people who are good are suffering and dealing with temporal problems. But if they give their lives to Jesus and they walk with Jesus, the eventuality is that they get to be with Him. Yeah. Proverbs 12 and verse 28 says, In the path of righteousness is life, 
And in its past pathway, there is no death. And someone says, wait a minute, but even, even if I walk righteously, I'm still going to die. It's appointed for man who wants to die and then the judgment. Yes, that is true. But that's not the death we're concerned about. It's the second death that Revelation refers to that we're concerned about. We don't have to worry about that. Death has been swallowed up by the victory of Christ. And, and so that's the idea that I think that really comes out there in the last few verses of Proverbs uh, chapter 10. So, the problem is, none of us are righteous. None of us. Romans chapter 3 tells us that. None of us are righteous. No, not one. Okay? Um, but, you know, I can't read Proverbs like a Pharisee and start thinking, okay, every single way that I'm not wise, I need to make sure I take care of, and every way that I uh, need to be wise, I need to add it to my life, and if I do that enough, if I build up just enough credit in my bank account, so to speak, then God's going to be okay with me. That's not the way that we're called to read this book. I must read it in light of Jesus' sacrifice, of Him giving His blood to buy me back, to ransom me, to redeem me. I need to read it like a blood-bought child of God, forgiven and enabled to be righteous and to be wise. So my friends, this morning, as you deal with the crisis, as you deal with the struggles and the concerns and the worries and the fears, don't think for an instant that Proverbs doesn't have something to share with you to help you deal with them. There's wonderful advice. We need to hear it. We need to listen to it. We need to take it in. We need to use it in our everyday lives uh, throughout this, this crisis and throughout our lives as well. So this morning, I know that we're not going to necessarily have a traditional uh, sort of invitation, but we are going to sing a song of encouragement. And as we sing that song, please be thinking about some ways that you need to respond to God, some ways that you need to pray to Him and ask for forgiveness, some ways that you can adjust your life to be more in line, in line with His way, with His walk. Think of someone that you could talk to. Maybe it's one of us that you could call that we could help you deal with those different, different kinds of struggles. And if it's somebody who wants to be baptized, I tell you, I will put on the hazmat suit and I will come to your house and we will put water in your bathtub and we will baptize you so that your sins are washed away so you can walk in the newness of life. Whatever it takes, my friends, so that you can be in a good standing with God. Let's do that this morning. And we're going to stand here in just a moment.